deputized by our uh, leaders this morning, uh, Professor Ahmed Ragab and Harry Bastramajian, to call everybody here to order. Uh, my name is Tariq Masoud, and I'm the uh, director of the Al Walid bin Talal uh, Islamic Studies program here at Harvard. We are one of the organizations that has the great honor of co-sponsoring this event in honor of Professor Graham. The other institutions are the Harvard Divinity School, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for the Study of World Religions, the Science, Religion, and Culture Program at the Divinity School, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. And I think the breadth of organizations that have come together to make uh, today possible is a testament to the kind of person and scholar that Professor Graham is. I've known him for about 10 years, ever since I got here to Harvard. I've always been in awe of him, both as the embodiment of what a Harvard professor uh, should be, and as the embodiment of an adult. You know, that's sort of who I want to be when I grow up. Um, and uh, to have been asked to be his successor as the chair of the Al Walid program, which I think of as the kind of institutional embodiment of what he has tried to do over the course of his 50 year uh, career here, which is to um, uh, deepen and broaden the study of Islam in the West and at Harvard. It's deeply humbling and uh, I could not resist the opportunity to uh, honor him. So I will now turn uh, things over to uh, the organizer of today's event, our leader, another tremendous scholar and adult who I aspire to grow up to be like, and that is Professor Ahmed Raga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tar. I, I don't think of myself as an adult, but OK. <laughs> so we'll try. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. And um, first, I would like to thank uh, Harry and Mariam for all the work that they have done here, and, for, and also the dean's office at the Divinity School for all their work in helping organize this. Um, there are so many people um, who are not in the room today who really wanted to be in the room. We've been contacting a lot of the people who worked with Bill for years before, and there are so many people around Harvard and around the world, really, that really wanted to be here. But at a moment, we had to choose a date, and by choosing a date, there are so many other people that were not able to come. But the idea of um, the fact that all of these people wanted to come, the fact that all of you are here today is, as Tari mentioned, a testament to the work that Bill has done over the years. Um, and um, and in, when we started, Harry and I started talking about organizing this particular event, um, Bill's idea was that if, if you are going to do an event, this needs to be, or that he would prefer an event that would allow people to talk and have a conversation, which um, both Harry and I believed was another instance of Bill's intellectual generosity, the idea that um, an event of that sort should still be dedicated to people uh, spending time uh, with each other and talking and discussing and um, having a fruitful conversation. Um, so uh, on his request, we're going to delay all the toasts to dinner. He didn't request the dinner. This is something that I'm adding. <laughs> we're going to have to have it, Bill. I'm sorry. Uh, but for now, we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to start to have um, such, a, you know, the talks and discussions from such wonderful group of people that we have today. Uh, before, before we start, I would like to just um, take a few minutes to um, say a few things from, uh, about Bill's career over the years. Um, Bill Graham received his PhD from Harvard University in 1973. Uh, and he has been uh, a member of the Harvard faculty since 73 uh, and was a member of the Faculty of Divinity here from 2002 to 2018. Um, he served as the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, uh, the master of Career House, the chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, the chair of the Committee on the Study of Religion, the core curriculum committee on foreign cultures at Harvard, and the program, Al Walid Program on Islamic Studies. Um, and, of course, he served as the Dean of Harvard Divinity School from 2002 to 2012. Bill's scholarly work, as, we, uh, as you all know, has focused on early Islamic religious history and textual traditions, particularly the Quran and Hadith, and on topics in the global history of religion. 
Some of his many publications include Divine Word and Prophetic Word in Early Islam in 1977, Beyond the Written Word, Oral Aspects of Scripture in the History of Religion in 1987, Three Face, One God, co-authored with, Ju with uh, Jacob Neusner and uh, Bruce Chilton in uh, 2002, and in 2010, Islamic and Comparative Religious Studies Selected Writings. Um, Bill, in 2012, received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Journal of Law and Religion, and he also has held a number of um, distinguished fellowships from the Guggenheim, the Alexander van Humboldt, and many others. I think the... Um, when one looks at this, and this is obviously, you know, it's a much longer CV. I just selected things because you're not here to listen to me. Um, but I think what one uh, sees immediately is the profound impact that Bill has had on the study of Islam um, around the field and also more pro even most prominently here at Harvard. Uh, Bill has been uh, leading the various uh, institutes and bodies on campus that have um, sort of that, that made uh, or that allowed for the study of uh, Islam at Harvard. And as such, uh, he has contributed to the making of definitely the field at Harvard as we know it and to the field at large. And a lot of the work that many people, many of us and many people outside the room are doing um, owes a lot to uh, what Bill has uh, accomplished. So uh, before I introduce the chair of the first panel, uh, please join me in um, congratulating Bill on such wonderful time. So uh, for our first panel, um, Kimberly is here. She's on her way, she just called. Okay, so um, our, uh, the chair of the first panel, I will introduce her, uh, Professor Kimberly Patton. Um, it's uh, traffic has been terrible on the I-90 today, so she's a little late, but she will be here momentarily. She's parking. Uh, professor Kimberly Patton is professor of the Comparative and Historical Study of Religion. She received her uh, master's and PhD uh, from uh, Harvard. She, uh, she specializes in ancient Greek religion and archaeology with research interests in archaic sanctuary and the iconography of sacrifice. She also teaches in the history of world religions offering courses in cross-cultural religious phenomenology. Uh, these courses include ritual studies, the mythology of natural elements, religious art and iconoclasm, uh, the interpretation of dreams, animals in religion and myth, ritual weeping, material, holiness, angels and uh, angelology, and funerary cults. Her latest book, Religion of the Gods, Ritual, Paradox, and Reflexivity, uh, was published by Oxford University Press in 2009 and won the 2010 American Academy of Religion Book Award for Excellence in Religious Studies and in the Analytical and Descriptive category. Um, so Kimberly is going to be here momentarily. Uh, I think we can, you know, maybe you can have some more coffee in, in a couple of minutes. We will be ready to start. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my great uh, honor and privilege to chair the first panel in this uh, celebration and symposium, Thinking Islam Within Religious Studies, Methods, Histories, and Futures, uh, in honor of Professor Bill Graham, William Graham. Um, my name is Kimberly Patton. I am professor in the Comparative and Historical Study of Religion here at the Divinity School and uh, in the Committee on the Study of Religion. Um, and I don't uh, certainly want to get in any kind of competitive arm wrestling, but I think I think I might have known Professor Graham, I won't say the longest, but one of the longest uh, lengths of time, um, which has been um, such a privilege for me. Um, we first met uh, when I was uh, 17 years old and thinking of transferring colleges, and um, he persuaded me to come to Harvard and persuaded me to leave the uh, second order study of English literature and take up the uh, real order study of religion, uh, which is uh, where things were actually happening that concerned the writers of English literature. So I'm always grateful to him. Since then, he's been a teacher, a colleague, a friend, and I'm just so happy to see um, this day um, in your honor, Bill, and um, uh, so happy to see you and Barbara here. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to Harry um, and to Ahmed for organizing this. The first panel today um, is called the Quran and Scriptural Studies, and we'll have four panelists: um, Dr. Mohsen Gudarzi, excuse me, uh, 
Dr. Jane McAuliffe, Dr. Uh, Shadi Nasser, and uh, Dr. Walid Salah. Um, so I will introduce each of them in order. They'll each have uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and um, uh, I'll ask them to, um, to try to respect that. They've assured me they will. Um, then I will ask uh, the panel to offer any comments to one another, any kind of discussion or exchange you might like to have uh, to each other's presentations. And then I will uh, open up the floor to uh, questions and comments from the audience. So our first uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Mohsen Gudarzi, who is Assistant Professor in Classical and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Minnesota, focusing on the intellectual and social aspects of the emergence of Islam, and uh, in particular, the Quran's relationship to late antique literature. Okay, Professor Gudarzi. Thank you so much. Uh, it is an honor, really, to be here um, in such distinguished company and for this uh, wonderful occasion. Um, I have some praise, but I'll leave it for the end of the talk. Um, so uh, I wanted to begin speaking about some of the ways in which uh, Professor Graham's uh, research on the Quran in particular, um, I think sort of stands out from what precedes and what follows it um, in some ways, and I'll take a long look um, and if we think about the origins of uh, the modern study of the Quran in the Western Academy in the 19th century, um, we can speak of the dominance of source-critical approaches to the Quran. And they are the approaches that are interested in finding out the precise uh, sources of specific Quranic accounts, stories, ideas in various biblical or post-biblical writings. Um, and uh, the, the sort of classic early example of that is Abraham Geiger's uh, What Did Muhammad Borrow from Judaism? And there follows essentially a tug of war between people who argue that Christian sources are the major inspiration for the Quran and or Jewish sources are. Uh, the Jewish foundations of Islam is something that Charles Torrey authors, we have Richard Bell author in the early uh, 20th century, uh, the origins of Islam and its Christian environment. So we have that kind of uh, competition between um, two camps that are trying to find sources of the Quran. Um, and of course the origins of that are that kind of approach um, is applied to the Bible at, also at the same time. But in, in, in the case of the Quran, there is sometimes a polemical aspect or polemical tone to it. Um, there's a nice quote that sort of exemplifies that from William Muir, the Scottish uh, Orientalist and colonial administrator who worked in India in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, he authored a major biography of the prophet in English. And Muir, sort of in the context of discussing the story of Ishmael and the Quran, refers to it as a travestied plagiarism from scripture. And sort of that sentiment um, is there but I think uh, after the Second World War, it, it seems to sort of subside to some extent. And I think Professor Graham's uh, work is a really major example of departure from the source critical approach in some ways. And um, it's a really serious, sustained, uh, and honest attempt to understand the Quran on its own terms in a way. So regardless of what inspirations or echoes we might uh, be able to find for the Quran, what if we take the text seriously and try to understand uh, you know, its own logic? And one of the good examples of that, I think, is uh, in Professor Graham's article, uh, The Quran as a Discourse of Signs, which addresses a um, really old um, non-Muslim complaints about the Quran that it's sort of just disjointed or it's episodic, that it moves from one subject to another without any apparent relation between the two. Um, and Professor Graham proposes, you know, by really reading the Quran on its own terms, as I mentioned, he really proposes a convincing uh, explanation for why the text has this kind of structure. And I want to uh, read something from the essay itself, but basically the argument that he proposes is that the Quran is primarily meant to impart lessons um, by drawing attention to the 
um, signs of God in nature, in history, which the Quran sees as saturated with these signs. So it's really an attempt to give as many of these examples and lessons as possible, packed in the text, if you will. And that's why we have these sort of transitions. And if I just read something from the essay, uh, it speaks that the many of the unusual and unique aspects of the Quran's text, style, and content can be seen as logically consistent with the text's reiterated call to heed the manifold signs of God's sovereignty that are evident in creation, in history, and in revelation. So it's an attempt to really come to terms with the text, and instead of being dismissive, it really taking it seriously. And I think it really um, is one of the uh, most sort of developed examples of that, and the um, early examples of that in the Western study uh, of the Quran. But um, it is not just the case that Professor Graham's uh, work has tended to move away from source critical scholarship to a literary investigation of the text, uh, because it is not just limited to the text itself. Uh, it is not uh, the kind of sort of structuralist readings of the Quran, as we might find, for example, in Koshi Ibuizutsu's God and Man in the Quran, a really uh, good and classic text. Uh, but still, structuralist readings have tended to sort of treat the text as a static reality, as a timeless reality, and trying to sort of understand it um, as separate from the way in which it is read and um, engaged with. But Professor Graham approaches the Quran as a scholar of religion, first and foremost, not as uh, a Semiticist, uh, but as, uh, or a philologist more broadly, but as a scholar of religion. So he's interested in how uh, the, the kind of significance that the text has for its community. And this uh, approach follows from the premise that a text is scripture not because there is anything inherent to it, but because there is a community that agrees to invest the text with authority. So there's a community that is interested in treating the text as special, and that's why we're studying it. So maybe we should also take that community's experience of the text seriously. And uh, a prime example of that is, of course, Beyond the Written Word, which really tries to push the boundaries of the concept of scripture as such, um, and make us recognize that it's often in the lived experience of not only Muslims, but many Jewish and Christian communities or Hindu communities, uh, both historically and in a contemporary world. It is something that uh, is recited, is uh, chanted, is memorized, is coded in arguments in a very lively, dynamic, oral and oral way. So these aspects of what we tend to maybe treat as just texts that are written and printed for us to study, he tries to, um, because of that approach for the study of religions, Professor Graham tries to um, make us cognizant of the really significant oral and oral dimensions of the Quran, but also other scriptures. And here I want to use that to segue into um, the, the other point, is that because Professor Graham is a scholar of religion, philology is just a tool that he uses. Um, and that's, again, not often the case if you read a lot of scholarship in the 19th century, in the 20th century, they're always sort of drowned in philological discussions, and it's you know an example of uh, if you can't follow this, then you're not good enough. For example, it's really about you needing to have the linguistic training, and philology takes center stage. Um, but in Professor Graham's work, both uh, in in its content, but also in its structure, philology is really just a tool, a stepping stone for understanding religious phenomena, and it's evident in the structure of his works because both in Beyond the Written Word and also in Divine Word and Prophetic Word, the philological discussion tends to be in the end notes, which are great, but you can actually read the text. Many people can read the text without having that philological training, and it's a very sort of conscious choice. I remember uh, a few years ago I was reading, uh, I was searching for Beyond the Written Word in the Hollis Library, but um, I came across a review of it, which was written maybe uh, in the 80s. I don't remember the exact words of the review, and I couldn't find it for our purposes, but I think the reviewer had also recognized this feature and was speaking as basically the, the text being something that everyone can read, 
uh, and maybe also suitable for undergraduate courses. And the end notes basically representing a graduate seminar in a way. And it's really something that you can use for that kind of teaching. And it's something that Professor Graham has pushed me to do, unfortunately, not to much avail, but <laughs> <laughs> so far, but maybe that will change. Um, and the last point I wanted to mention is that, um, again, because of his uh, training and his uh, approach as a scholar of religion, I think Professor Graham has tended to consider Islam or the Quran not as a sui generis, as something of its own kind, uh, but within the broader context of religious history. Um, and that's been made possible because he has expertise also in other languages like Sanskrit and Greek and so on, which isn't often right now. As one of my friends put it, uh, they don't make uh, scholars like that anymore. Uh, so it, it's that kind of broad comparative framework that you find the same, the beginnings of the study of religion from Friedrich Max Muller, for example. There's this emphasis that religion as a phenomena has something to it, as a category has something to it, and you have to take seriously the different forms and try to put things in a comparative framework and context, which Professor Graham does, for example, also in Beyond the Written Word. Uh, but it is not something that's done very much today, so hopefully um, that may change. Um, I'd like to end by saying, so, so echoing something that both uh, Tariq and Ahmed had mentioned, um, and I say this in, in the acknowledgement section of my dissertation, which I doubt Professor Graham has seen, so I'll just say it here, and it's that I really do consider him both um, in his scholarship, uh, but also in the style of teaching that he's had and in his mentoring uh, as a uh, great example, or in the Quranic term, as an Uswa Hassan, really. Um, and uh, I'm very sort of happy that I had the chance to study with him. And I've often pondered um, why his works uh, don't get uh, outdated. Uh, I don't have a good answer for it yet, but it is honestly something that I've thought about. You know, why are we still reading um, the earliest meaning of the Quran or beyond the return? Not as classics that have been sort of abrogated in a way, but as something that's still, you know, maybe the final word on the subject, or at least the best source to go for the subject. And I I've thought about it um, a lot. I, I don't have a ready-made answer, but I think it's partly. Um, by staying away from uh, perhaps what's fashionable uh, and trying to focus on a problem that seems to be significant within the tradition itself, within the text itself, um, and also just trying to be honest and not thinking about you know making an argument that might be intriguing or interesting or provocative, but really trying to get at the truth in a way, while recognizing all the subjective aspects of it. Uh, so that's what I had to say. And again, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful experience as a mentor. Uh, it's really an honor. It's been an honor. And thank you so much for you. To you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kudarzi. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Jane McAuliffe, who is the director of the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress and uh, the head of the Office of Scholarly Programs at the Library of Congress, um, and also a distinguished fellow at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown. Um, she uh, is also the general editor of the six-volume encyclopedia of the Quran, um, uh, with a number of forthcoming um, publications, and it's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. McAuliffe. Gotta rotate that. Good morning. I can't tell you how much I look, f I've been looking forward to this morning and the chance to get back together with friends and colleagues from decades in many cases. It's not something I often have an opportunity to do, so this is very, very special. Um, I know we're not supposed to eulogize Bill, 
but perhaps I'll be forgiven for uttering a few words of praise because, like Mussen, Bill's work has been so important in my own scholarly de development. Um, again, like Mussen, let's take us back, not maybe to the 19th century, but um, say about 30 years in the history of Quranic scholarship. There was, of course, an overwhelming stress on the textual. And my own research fell right into this groove. It was all about the Quran and its many multi-volume commentaries, both medieval and modern. Then in 87, Bill published Beyond the Written Word. The book provided, to use a kind of old-fashioned phrase, a paradigm shift. Along with Christina Nelson's 1985 musicological study of Quran recitation in Egypt and later work on the recitation of the Quran in Indonesia, it opened another Quranic world. Uh, the study of the Quran, at least for me, expanded from the eyes to the ears to the ethnographic. And then in the mid-90s, my connection with Bill moved from intellectual influence to collaborator and co-worker. Because as I was starting the work on the Encyclopedia of the Quran, Bill generously joined the group of associate editors along with Claude Gilio, Wadad Qadi, and the late Andy Rippon. And Bill's expansive vision of Quranic studies ensured that the EQ included textual studies but also reached out to anthropological work, um, to the visual arts and architecture, to the study of material culture. And to this day, Bill and I continue our work together with the EQ online um, as it, as it in, uh, continues to increase in that format. Um, I'm gonna explain why there's a picture of the Bible Museum up here in just a minute, <laughs> but. Um, no, but. I wanted to talk, say a few things now about um, a shift that I'm making in my own work because the primary focus of my work has been, as I said, primarily the Quran and its interpretation. If there was one theme to it throughout several decades, I think it would be the persistent effort to make the Quran more accessible to those in other fields and to the wider public. That's so that, um, but after retiring from Bryn Mawr College, I was invited to spend a year in the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. And I'll pause here to put in a plug for the Kluge Center, at, uh, which is the residential research center at the Library of Congress. I am actually no longer director of the Kluge Center. I now oversee the operation that includes that. Um, but, but I did spend a year there uh, at the Kluge Center finishing a book and then, you know, one thing led to another, and I was asked to be the director for a while, and then I was asked to set up a whole new division for the Library of Congress that subsumes all of the ways in which the library reaches out to the American public, everything from our exhibits to our, our visitor services. We get about two million visitors to the Library of Congress a year to the National Library uh, for the Blind. Um, our lecture series, our, our scholar center, the, the whole way in which the library does serve and can, will continue to enhance its services to um, the American people. It's, as you can imagine, a pretty fun and fascinating position. And it's been fun to learn the world of cultural institutions after having been in the world of academic institutions all my life. It's also interesting to learn the world of federal bureaucracies. But being at the Library of Congress has really reawakened my interest in all things American. The library is, as you can imagine, a treasure trove of American history. Among the things I um, oversee is our National Book Festival, which is a huge annual event in Washington that regularly showcases prominent popular historians. Another thing I do is host breakfasts and dinners for um, members of Congress. And again, these, the focus of these are, are often book talks, and these book talks are themselves often by prominent historians. And you know, the library has an ever-changing display of its Americana treasures. There are all kinds of lectures and symposiums, so it's pretty hard to spend time there, surrounded by all of these opportunities, and not discover, or at least rediscover, a fascination for our nation's history. Then a couple of more specific prompts uh, that have moved me in a somewhat different direction. 
I live in the Georgetown section of Washington, D.C., and in my local public library, I happened upon the portrait of a former slave. When I saw it, I recognized the connection with a portrait I'd seen in Philadelphia at the, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art when I was living in Bryn Mawr. Um, the one in Philly was painted by Charles Wilson Peale, who also painted Was George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton. Both portraits are of the same subject, Yaro Mamut, about whom I'll say more in a few minutes. The Georgetown Public Library owns and displays Mamut's portrait because he used to live just a few blocks from the library. So that was one thing that kind of started to stimulate an interest in another direction in my work in Quranic studies. Second was being asked to collaborate on a major exhibit at the Smithsonian. Um, in the fall of, 19, of 2016, the Smithsonian um, mounted an exhibit called The Art of the Quran, Treasures from the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art. It was the largest exhibit of Quranic manuscripts ever mounted in the US, and it drew tens of thousands of visitors and won awards for its cur curators. All of that has prompted me to begin, and I'm only just beginning to learn more about the history of the Quran in America. Uh, that exploration started with a plenary lecture that I gave at the Turkish Embassy in conjunction with the academic conference that was hosted as this exhibit, this Smithsonian exhibit opened. In crafting that lecture, I was trying to put myself in the shoes of the average visitor to that Smithsonian exhibit. So I structured the lecture in the form of a series of questions. And the last question I, I addressed was, does the Quran have anything to do with America? And in subsequent lectures, I've continued to explore that, and this morning gives me another small opportunity to do so. Again, going back to Bill's influential book, as well as his subsequent publications, I'm starting this work with the assumption that one cannot study the history of the Quran in America without taking full account of the place of the Bible in American history and culture. You know, I think we can all agree that this country has long been a Bible-saturated society. So, you know, I won't spend a lot of time on the defense of that proposition, but I'll point to a couple of things. In 2014, the Pew Research Center did one of its um, religious landscape studies, and one of the questions they asked was about the reading of scripture, and they, did, they came up with a statistic that one-third of Americans say they read scripture at least once a week. Another thing that I will point to is, uh, can we blow that up, that first slide? How, how would I do that? Just from here? Okay. Um, maybe just... Just the, this button here? Yes. Good. Thank you. As many of of you probably know, um, just recently a new museum opened in Washington. It's just blocks from the US Capitol. It's called the Museum of the Bible. I had some reluctance about visiting this museum, both because of the political and religious motivations of the donor to the museum. Um, and I'm not keen, you know, I'm not too keen on the kind of Disneyland-like recreations of village life in the time of Jesus. But because I uh, oversee the exhibits program at the Library of Congress, I felt that I had to make an effort to visit this new museum. So I did it in the company of a friend of mine who's a biblical scholar. Mm -hmm. And it was a mixed experience. But one of the things I did find was a very well curated exhibit on the Bible in American history, particularly in the African American experience. Um, some things in the permanent collection of the museum other things on loan from other um, museums and universities. What was especially interesting about that part of the museum was that that whole exhibit concludes with a great big screen which um, mounts an interactive uh, question and answer end of the exhibit. It's, a, it's an interactive Bible in America survey. So, 
The visitor to the museum stands in front of a console and answers questions that flash up on the screen, and the answers are, uh, the cumulative answers to these questions are recorded on the screen, usually in the form of word clouds. A wide range of, of questions, such things as, early, uh, these are true and false ones, earlier settlers to America had the freedom to interpret the Bible however they chose, true or false. The Bible supports the defense of religious freedom for all, true or false. Um, Thomas Jefferson cut up pages of his Bible and omitted certain parts. Removing or ignoring passages of, in, is an acceptable way to interpret the Bible, true or false. For me, the most interesting questions, though, came towards the end of the survey. And one was, how would you describe the Bible's impact on America today? And this, they divided the answers between the under 45 crowd and the over 45 crowd. But for, for both of them, the word clouds clustered around words like weak, fading, diminishing, declining, etc. But with some pretty big spaces taken up by important and powerful. The next question, however, was, in a word, how would you describe what the Bible's impact should be on America's future? And here it was all about important, significant, increasing, strong, influential. So I think the Bible still has a very strong place in American life and society. So what does that mean for looking at the Quran within the American context? That's a kind of background question, and since time is short, I'm just going to briefly touch on two areas I've begun to explore in, as I am in the beginning stages of the development of this project. One is to acknowledge and to recognize that the Quran was read by some of our founding fathers. John Adams, for example. And if I can now do this right, there we go, John Adams on the left. In the rare book room of the Boston Public Library, there is a book known as Adams 281.1. It's a copy of the Quran from John Adams' personal library. And his Quran was a copy of the first translation of the Quran published in the United States, printed in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1806. I think is pretty well known is that Thomas Jefferson also had a copy of the Quran. I'm always interested in Thomas Jefferson because his personal library became the core collection of the Library of Congress. And among his acquisitions, and consequently one of the ac among the acquisitions that is on permanent display at the Library of Congress, is the translation of the Quran that Jefferson owned that was done by the English scholar George Sale. Just as an aside, I think you might remember back to January 2007 when this copy, this two-volume copy of Sale's translation owned by Jefferson became the center of controversy when Representative Keith Ellison, um, the first Muslim to be elected to the House of Representatives, took his oath of office with his hand on this Quran. And it's interesting to think about the fact that that may help happen again next January because the person who's running for his seat, which Ellison is uh, vacating, this year is a woman named Ilhan Omar, who's currently in the Minnesota House of Representatives but is running for the 5th Congressional District. She took her oath of office when elected to the Minnesota House on a Quran, and I have no doubt she will do the same when, when or if, she comes to Washington. But let's go back even further than the founding days of the Republic. The current scholarly consensus is that the Quran probably arrived in colonial America on slave ships, most likely as an oral scripture held in the minds and memories of West African captives, of whom, as we know, although there are no obviously definitive statistics, were numbered in the tens of thousands. I'll speak about, or I'll mention briefly, just two of them. First being our friend Yaro Mahmoud, about whom I spoke uh, earlier. And he's pictured here in the two portraits. 
Mahmoud was born in West Africa in 1736. We don't know how he was captured, but we do know that in 1752, he made a slave crossing to America on the Elijah. He was owned for 44 years by the Beale family of Maryland, worked as a body servant, and traveled with his owner, a tobacco farmer. He was manumitted in, manumitted in 1796 and moved to Georgetown, where he became a kind of banker for local merchants, both black and white. He bought a house in Georgetown. We know where it was. We know the address and the plot on which that house stood. And in fact, that site, it was the site of a, an archaeological dig three years ago by the DC Office of Archaeology. His real renown comes from these two portraits. He was painted in 1819 um, by Charles Wilson Peale. That's the portrait on the left, which hangs in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And Peale also wrote Mahmoud's obituary and noted that he was interred in his garden, the spot where he usually resorted to pray. He was recognized as a Muslim, as an observant Muslim, and, um, and honored in that as, as that. The painting on the right was done in 1823 by a man named James Alexander Simpson, who was later an art professor at Georgetown University. And this is the one that hangs in the Georgetown Public Library, although at the moment it is on loan to the National Portrait Gallery, which is downtown in Washington. The second person that I want to mention is Omar Ibn Said. He too was born in West Africa, in northern Senegal, uh, enslaved during a military conflict and transported to the Carolinas around 1807. 20 years later, his final master, James Owens of Fayetteville, North Carolina, asked him to write about his capture, his deportation, and his treatment at the hands of earlier owners. His manuscript begins with Surat al-Mulk, uh, the 67th surah of the Quran. It's written in Arabic, uh, obvious evidence of his education and former status as a scholar. And translations of the manuscript soon followed, and it had pretty wide dissemination. Today, the mosque in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which of course was badly hit a couple of weeks ago by uh, Hurricane Florence, is named after Omar Ibn Said. The manuscript itself is an interesting story of loss and discovery. It's the only American slave memoir written in Arabic, so far as we know. While it was well known in the pre-Civil War period, interest in it waned after the war, and for a long time it was thought to be in the possession of the American Numismatic Society, and then it went missing, and nobody knew where it was for decades and decades. In 1995, it was discovered in an old trunk in Alexandria, Virginia, um, in a house that belonged to descendants of a former president of the American Numismatic Society. It was sold at auction and purchased by a private collector who displayed it occasionally at museums and libraries and gave access to some scholars. The connection here with the, the kind of biblical interface is that its early dissemination was promoted heavily by the American Colonization Society, who were eager to uh, showcase a literate Muslim because they were building this colony or promoting this colony for freed slaves in Liberi Liberia and recognized that literacy came to West Africa, to large parts of West Africa, through Islam, which, which had brought um, Arabic and the Quran to West Africa. And so early Bible translations in that period were also in Arabic. And it was a, a way of beginning to set the stage for a face-off of the Quran and the Bible in this new West African country. So as I said, the it was discovered, it was bought by a private collector, and then last year, the Omar Ibn Said's manuscript was acquired by the Library of Congress. It's currently in our conservation department, being prepared for digitization and then eventual public display. So I've touched very briefly on just a few strands of the work that I'm now starting. It's still focused on the Quran, but it shifts the context closer to home. Um, a few 
few years ago, in 2013, Bill published an article entitled, Winged Words, Scriptures and Classics as Iconic Texts. He used the wonderful Homeric phrase, winged words, to speak about those very special texts that embed themselves in the collective psyche of a people and a tradition. I really love that phrase, and I hope that it will inspire me to keep exploring how the Quran has been and will be winged words in America. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McAuliffe. And one nice thing about being a scholar is you can publish hourly errata. So Kluge Center, and I apologize for that. <laughs> and if you don't publish the errata, someone else will publish them for you. That's another great thing about our vocation. Um, our next, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and uh, fascinating. Um, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Shadi Nasser, who is assistant professor of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations um, here at Harvard. Uh, he teaches Arabic literature and Islamic civilizations uh, courses, um, working with uh, Professor Graham, of course, uh, and also with uh, Wolfhard Heinrichs, late Wolfhard Heinrichs. Um, and his uh, research interest is in Quranic studies in general, um, but also in uh, pre-Islamic and early Islamic poetry and Akbar literature. Um, so Dr. Nasser. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And um, I will start with the um, anecdote that uh, probably Bill doesn't remember. Um, uh, probably this is you know, one of the uh, uh, rare occasions that I mentioned this. Um, so 2011, I defended my dissertation. Uh, Bill was uh, on the committee uh, back then. I uh, was working at Yale uh, during that time. And uh, for uh, certain reasons, complicated, I submitted my dissertation uh, to Bill and to other members of the committee probably six weeks uh, before the defense. And then Bill uh, sent me an email uh, back then and he said, uh, Dear Shadi, this is like you know, too soon of a notice. Uh, this is not how we do things here at Harvard. Um, and then I apologized to Bill. You know, there were certain circumstances that I couldn't really submit uh, you know, before that. And then I was so scared, you know, those during the time that, you know, Bill will just, you know, tell this is unacceptable, <laughs> this is a horrible dissertation, redo, <laughs> postpone my graduation. Um, during the defense, um, Bill was actually very supportive of the dissertation. He, um, he gave me excellent feedback. And he was, um, along with the other members of the committee, he was really very supportive uh, to uh, publish the dissertation which back then, of course, I was uh, very, you know, weary. It's like, oh, this is just, you know, um, a dissertation. It's not uh, ready. And Bill was, no, just like work on it, you know, uh, incorporate the feedback and publish it. And um, I did, and um, I published the dissertation uh, the following year, Transmission of the Variant Readings of the Quran, which um, uh, I have been working on and I'm still working on. Um, and I'm very, you know, grateful for, um, and that's how Bill usually uh, treats and treated all his students, even though we give him uh, things on short notice, he will still... Uh, and uh, yes. Um, so, um, so because of that, uh, I'm still uh, really, because of uh, Bill and other colleagues also um, encouragement, I'm still working on the same topic. Uh, this is something that also uh, Bill is very interested in. Uh, transmission of the Quranic text. Um, uh, what does the Quran mean? Uh, we usually, of course, take it for granted. You know, the Quran, of course, is the holy book of the Muslims. But then, uh, what does really the text uh, mean? What it meant for early Muslims? What it means right now as a scripture and as a text? And one of the things that um, I'm interested in is the transmission of the text. So how did we uh, get um, to this point? Um, and what is the variant readings of the Quran. What are the different transmissions of uh, this text? Uh, how did Muslims uh, 1400 years ago until today, uh, how did they react to those variant transmissions of the text? Different recensions, different renditions. Um, and that's something that, um, back to the philologi philological work, um, I think we are um, in Islamic studies slash Arabic studies, we are still um, uh, a little bit behind when it comes to very 
uh, thorough philological uh, work when it comes to textual study, especially with these early texts. Um, so may I have the, oh, I will just click from here, exit. Um, oops, this one right here. Um, so I will be working, um, uh, I'm current, I currently finished uh, my second uh, manuscript, uh, which is still now under review, and it's very, uh, the topic um, uh, of the book um, is an extension of my dissertation and also the, the first book I published, which is uh, on a period that I call the second canonization of the Quran. Um, and I believe, you know, that the Quran uh, underwent several stages of standardization over the past 1400 years. And uh, it was not, and it is not a static text, whether in its interpretation or whether um, in the final form uh, that, you know, we have it today. Uh, so um, the main line of research that um, I work on is um, how the text uh, very subtly and over a very long period of time, um, it underwent changes. And these changes, um, even though um, many people will look at them as um, a non-significant when it comes to bickering and fighting over a vowel or over a case ending or over uh, uh, whether there is a long vowel or a short vowel, uh, I still think if, we, if you take it from a theological perspective that the Quran is the word of God and how Muslims reacted to that, uh, it just gives us uh, an important perspective of how uh, Muslims were dealing with these variations and how Muslims were dealing with the holy book. Um, Without going into, into many details, um, this is a, um, a chart um, that um, shows you um, that the uh, Quran that we have today uh, goes through basically seven uh, different, uh, what we call readings, okay? Now, this is the first step that most people probably in Islamic studies, uh, they are aware of. We have something called the seven variant readings of the uh, which means, for those who are not familiar with the term, that if you want to read the Qur'an, uh, the only channel through which you can read the Qur'an, or through the only channel through which you access the Qur'an, is through these seven people. So without these seven people, we don't have Qur'an, to put it more bluntly. Um, we have manuscripts, but these manuscripts, the only way to uh, decode these manuscripts is through these people. Now, this is one phase of what we call canonization. These people selected a variant um, um, uh, from a corpus of different readings, and then they selected what they thought was the proper way of reading the Quran, and through them, we have the what we call the seven different or variant readings of the Quran. Now, um, we get to the second stage, what we call a canonical rally or canonical transmission. So the second question is, how did we receive the readings or the renditions of these people. Well, each one of them, they had many students. Um, some of them had five, seven, 10, 20. Uh, but if we go back to historical sources, we find that only two out of the many different students of these people, they transmitted their reading or their rendition. And the question would be, what happened to the other students of these people? Um, so, did they transmit the same variations from this master? And the second question is, let's say each one of those, they have two students. Did these two students transmit the same variant or the same reading of the master? And the answer is no, they did not. Um, so again, we ask the question, if we have one reading here, why do we have different readings from two students of the same master? Now, of course, the question go further. We don't stop here. We go to another phase. So how did we receive the transmission of each of these students? Well, also through their students. And again, out of many, many students of each of these transmitters, we have also two students per, per person. And also each of these, they transmitted a different version from their master. Uh, again, we are talking here about slight variations, but they are important in the text. So ultimately, if you, took, if you take these numbers, you will find that if you really add those numbers, more or less, you would have for each person, let's say 34 and 49 different renditions of the text. And then you would come up with 
basically all these different transitions of the text, uh, which could be read in different variations and in different forms. Um, and again, we ask the question, what does it mean that you know, we have the Quran as is? Uh, and what did it mean for the Muslims to transmit the Quran in different ways and in different variations? Um, and how did Muslims back then think of the Quran as a scripture that is susceptible or that is able to undergo variations versus now where the common notion is the Quran was transmitted as is verbatim uh, from God to the prophet uh, through Gabriel. Um, so I want to... detail into um, the transmission. This is uh, one of the things that I try to do to understand now uh, the most common reading that uh, 1.2 billion Muslims are familiar with is what we call uh, Hafs an Asim, right? So uh, Asim is one of the seven autonomous readers. He's one of those seven. Hafs was one of his students. So now most Muslims are familiar with this rendition. And Hafs is a student of Asim. And the question is, how did we get Hafs and uh, again, we take it for granted in scholarship to say, well, of course, we have a manual that go back to Hafs, and Hafs transmitted this reading uh, from his master, Asim, and this is uh, how we follow the Quran today, based on that. But then you look at the biographical dictionaries, and you find that Hafs had many students, as you can see. So Hafs transmitted his own transmission or rendition through all these people. And the question I try to ask is, uh, which one of those students that we have the current transmission. And basically, we have this guy, okay? Without necessarily knowing who, who he was, but why did this person survive in terms of transmission, and why do we have his rendition of the Quran, and we don't have the rendition of all these other people? So what was so special about this person that his rendition of his master survived and the transmission of all these other people did not. Now, I want to read a quote from, from Bill's, um, uh, one of his articles on Isnat. And what um, he said here, a particular element of this Islamic traditionalism is pervasive, even indispensable. A sense of connectedness, or to coin an Arabic neologism for this, ittisaliya, uh, which is connectedness with the transmitters. Uh, the need or desire for personal connection, ittisal across the generations with the time and the personages of Islamic origins, something that has been a persistent value in Muslim thought and institutions over the centuries. In coining this term, I do not contend that Islam is unique in valuing personal connectedness, for such valuation might well uh, be taken as fundamental, even defining sociological trait of traditional as opposed to modern societies. And then he goes on to talk about Isnad paradigm. And this is a, uh, an example of an Isnad, which is a chain of transmission paradigm, that Muslim uh, traditionalism has most clearly and consistently expressed its need for connectedness, and specifically personal connectedness and variations on a single model, the Isnad paradigm. This paradigm derives from the central Islamic institution of the Hadith, uh, the collective corpus of the traditional reports, a Hadith, and um, ascribed to Muhammad or others of the first generation of Muslims. Um, so back to this model, uh, we try to understand how isnad or chains of transmission functioned or worked in Quran versus hadith. And uh, I will not go here into, into detail, but uh, we do find that there are the Muslim scholars, they treated isnad or they treated the ittisaliyah as Bill uh, called it, different from how they treated it in the sense, in the, in the, asp, in the um, situation of the Quran. Um, so let me read for you um, the, how Muslim scholars describe the personality of uh, this person. So again, I want, to, I want to emphasize here that without this person, we do not have the rendition of that person, which is a divine, canonical rendition of the Quran. So that's to keep this in mind. So without this man, 
we cannot have access to the qira'a or to the rendition of that verse. So let me read for you what this man, how he was described in biographical sources. I have collected you know, what, what, uh, what we have about all of them, but we don't have time to, to discuss uh, all of them, so I just chose um, uh, small excerpts. So Hisham bin Ammar, he is the, the canonical rawi of the, of the Dimashq reading, of the Syrian reading. Um, it says that when he got older, he became senile. And he started to read and recite anything that was given to him. He would repeat and transmit anything people told him without inquiring about its truth. But he was more trustworthy when he was younger. Okay. Now, Hisham transmitted 400 fabricated hadiths. In Arabic, <laughs> uh, with all apparently good isnads. A man by the name of Fadlak, his name Fadlak al-Razi probably, used to give these fabricated hadiths to Hisham, who did transmit them, and due to which he almost created a rupture in Islam. Hisham was dictating hadith one day when he was asked, who gave you this hadith? He answered, one of my teachers. When he was asked again, he yawned, closed his eyes, and from, from sleepiness, and Muhammad bin Muslim al-Razi said, I decided to stop narrating hadith of Hisham because he used to sell hadith. Um, Ahmad bin Hanbal, the famous uh, jurist, uh, said Hisham was fickle and frivolous. frivolous. Uh, one day he was sitting in public while his private parts were visible. A man told him, cover yourself. Hisham responded, have you seen it? Uh, God willing, you will never go blind in your life. So he had a sense of humor. Ibn Hanbal said, one must repeat the prayer if it was led by Hisham. Um, so the same comments, uh, we have these kind of derogatory comments in the biographies of the, what we call the canonical readers. And again, the question is, uh, why Muslims uh, still thought it was okay to transmit the Quran, which is the most important document, of course, in Islam, uh, why they still trusted Hisham, and uh, why they trusted Hafs, and why they trusted Atham in transmitting the text, and which is the holy text of Muslims, and they never had problems uh, when it came to basically uh, impugning or cross-examining Hisham as a Quran transmitter. Um, very quickly, uh, since I talked about Hafs and Asim, let me read also for you, and this is again Hafs and Asim, the um, the standard and canonical, again, version of most Muslims today. Um, it says that Ahmad bin Hanbal uh, said that the, uh, this, his hadith, the hadith of Hafs, was not to be transmitted. Ibn Ma'in stated that he was not trustworthy, while Al-Madini, those are all hadith critics, said that his hadith was weak and should be abandoned. Al-Bukhari said the hadith transmitters abandoned Hafs' hadith, Tarakuhu, and an nasai confirmed that his hadith must neither be learned nor written down. Other critics said that all his hadith were manakir and bawatil in Arabic. They were all fabricated and they were all forged. Um, not only was he untrustworthy in hadith, but it was reported that his colleague Shu'ba was more reliable than him in Quran. Um, and then we have uh, some reported that Hafs was a better reciter than Shu'ba, but he was a liar, kathab. Um, and this is Hafs. So this is how Hafs is, you know, was depicted in biographical information. Same with Asim. I will not also read that, but the, um, I have a very beautiful quotation here from, some, from someone who said, anyone whose name was Asim had bad memory. So if your name is Asim, it means you just like you can't memorize things. And again, this is the uh, most important canonical um, uh, rawi. Uh, i.e. transmitter of, um, of the Qur'an. Um, so, um, again, uh, the question is here, the, the reason why I go into detail into trying to document the students, the transmitters, who transmitted what, is try to understand what was happening you know, during that early period and uh, why Muslim scholars, exegetes, uh, theologians, um, how did they look at the Qur'an? Um, and I do believe that the way they, they treated the scripture or the way they, lo they looked at the Quran uh, was somehow different from how in the past 200 years Muslims look at the Quran. Uh, yes, of course they thought that this is the word of God, this is a verbatim transmission from God to Gabriel to Muhammad, but at least they were um, 
uh, let's say, a little bit relaxed about the fact that, you know, the Quran could go into different variations or different modes of recitation, but that's okay, no problem. We have, we have no problem with that, uh, unlike the discourse in Islamic uh, theology and uh, Quranic interpretation. I would say post, I can't, I'm generalizing here, but I would say post Ottoman period, I would say post 1400, 1500, where things were very standardized uh, through probably uh, manuals and manuals of basically uh, studying at, at, at schools, at madrasas, where you memorize that the Quran is this way, but uh, then you don't go into detail into trying to explore uh, what was going on in the traditional sources. And um, um, I think you know this kind of uh, trying to understand um, uh, the Quran from that perspective, even though it is a, um, a very detailed philo philological work in that sense, but I think it sheds light on how Muslims over the past 1400 years really approached the Quran, uh, how they recited it, how they transmitted it, and even though um, they, it was uh, susceptible to this kind of variations and transmissions, they really still uh, venerated this text, they memorized it, uh, they wrote about it, and um, um, they cherished it. Um, so I will uh, stop here. Um, this is just like a very uh, short excerpt from you know the work I have been uh, doing uh, since 2011. And uh, thank you all for listening. And again, thank you, Bill, so much for uh, always being supportive. So yeah. Thank you so much, Shadi. Well, I think you've opened the floodgate to Bill's stories, um, and uh, it was uh, which I want to encourage throughout the day. Um, and it was um, uh, really interesting to hear that you were on the receiving end of uh, Bill's uh, famously apparently opposite attributes, but which are really complementary: um, the epic scolding and the deep generosity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and generally one discovers them in, in that order. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like in the Talmud and the Quran, the, the mercy overcomes uh, the justice always. Um, so uh, Bill and I had the chance to teach uh, Religion 2001 a number of times, our, our uh, required uh, Batan death march through theories and methods in the study of religion for our doctoral students. I'm dealing with them by myself right now, and I'm, I'm gearing up to share some of Bill's um, really famous um, uh, sayings. Uh, sayings tradition. Um, the one that comes to mind at the moment uh, about final papers is if it's too if it's too short, it better be good. If it's too long, it better be interesting. So <laughs> that's one that they all learned. Um, our next um, uh, and final uh, speaker is uh, Professor Walid Salah, um, who uh, grew up in uh, Lebanon. Um, he was educated at uh, the American University of Beirut in. Uh, Arabic literature and language, also did his doctorate at Yale in Islamic studies. Um, his research foci include uh, the Quran and its exegesis uh, in medieval Islamic civilization. Um, he's also um, uh, researched and published in apocalyptic literature uh, and in Arabic literature, and it's an honor to have you here. Um, did I give your title? Um, professor it's, reflect, of, it's Reflections on Tafsir Studies. Yeah, uh, I, th I forgot to mention that you are the uh, Professor of um, Religion and, Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. I Thank you. the title of the talk now. Oh yeah, well now we've given both titles. Yeah, no, I didn't, other people didn't get the titles either. Yeah, many titles. I'm glad that... Uh, Already several people have mentioned the generosity of uh, Professor Graham. And actually, um, great scholars uh, are sometimes easy to have. You, if you work hard, you could, you could become a good scholar. Uh, but really, if you don't have generosity of the soul, that's really um, a lacking that uh, diminishes one's, uh, one's work. I have a chance, I have a personal story I'll keep for the dinner. But I have a chance to see him last year at uh, the AAR. There was a panel in which um, uh, Professor Asma Hilali was presenting her work. Um, she just published an important work on uh, uh, palimpsest of the Quran. And he was there. So I already teased her. I said, look, uh, Harvard is here. She, she works in France, so she didn't know what was going on. Um, and then, sure enough, after the, uh, the panel, Professor uh, Graham came and introduced himself. 
and I, I could hear him. Uh, I'm I'm from Harvard. Like the the humility and the eagerness to learn from others is amazing. Uh, the fact that he took from his time to be at that panel uh, is indicative of his intellectual curiosity. But also, uh, you went up and introduced yourself. It was uh, to see you in action, um, willing to put yourself out and introduce yourself was quite amazing. Today, I really want to talk about um, recent developments in the Islamic world in my field in Tafsir. Uh, it has to do with, I spent a year in the Middle East, uh, but I've been collecting material, and uh, so it's a really a report about the field. Now, these radical developments are transforming uh, the availability of primary sources uh, in a field that uh, in the last three, uh, 30 years have witnessed a remarkable uh, expansion. And they're forcing us to rethink how we study Tafsir. As a matter of fact, what is happening right now uh, in the Islamic world is akin to what happened at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when printing has took off and there was a massive uh, production in, in publications in the Islamic world. Now, there are three areas um, uh, for in the Middle East. Egypt, which is not surprising, but the Gulf and Turkey are showing up, which is quite interesting. Now, in the case of Egypt, it's unlike what used to be uh, before. It's Saudi money that is generating these new, um, uh, new publications. So an ex-minister from uh, Saudi Arabia, Al-Turki, has teamed up with a publication house in Egypt, Dar Hajar, to reproduce and produce uh, the, uh, the classics of Islamic uh, exegetical tradition. Now, this is um, using the resources of uh, 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 graduates from Al-Azhar, but also the money that allows them to collect the manuscripts in ways that was not feasible before. Um, now, the teamwork that is uh, at the heart of this work is really what is transforming the way of producing this book, uh, these books. Now, these are massive books, 24 volumes, 30 volumes, 27 volumes, so, and each volume is a 900 to 1,000 pages. So we're talking about really uh, some of the most uh, expensive uh, works in Islamic civilization. The fact that they're being done by teamwork is what explaining the speed and the efficiency and the good quality. Now, uh, these new editions uh, are what one hopes for. All the manuscripts are collected. Uh, all previous uh, publications are assessed and the new far superior edition is produced. Um, so they, and they've been like, there seems to be a, quite a systematic way of doing this, uh, which is quite surprising in the sense, yeah, this is what we want and they're doing it. So they've re-edited Al-Tabari um, in 24 volumes, and this edition should become the standard edition really, and have a chance to compare in detail it with the previous editions, and it corrects massive amounts of mistakes um, missed sentences, etc. So this is really uh, a serious work. Um, now the, the second one they published is a 17 volume of Adur al-Manthur, uh, which is a, a, a classical work from a Suyuti, 15th century Cairo. Now, to give you an example of what's going on, this Dur al-Manthur came out at the end of the 19th century in Cairo, and then reissued at the beginning of the 19th century in what we call uh, the maison page of Boulard, which is really uh, a moving of the manuscript page to an edited page with no editorial uh, change, and it's the same look. Basically, what you, you have a, almost like a printed manuscript. Now, it's, this, these works are notoriously hard to read, and uh, almost, uh, in a sense, uh, very foreboding. Um, this Dur al Mathur is the classic of what we call uh, tradition based Quran commentary. Uh, now, to have a 17 volume edition with massive footnotes telling us what's, uh, like, where are the sources from, it really radically opens the, the work and the, fee, uh, the, the access to such material. Of course, there's the, the obligatory redoing of Ibn Kathir, which, you know, you don't need it, but they've done it. And, but recently, last year, they just published a 27-volume edition of Al-Bahr al-Muhit of Abu Hayyan al-Arnati. Now, um, this is absolutely the, uh, the, the apex of 
Quran commentary uh, based on literature and philology. Uh, it came out in 1911 in Cairo in six volumes that are really impossible to read. Um, the reprints uh, that were done based on that edition is filled with mistakes. Mm. And then you, I always ask, when, when will somebody even dare to look at this work? And uh, they did. And it's 27 volume edition. Uh, massive, beautiful, and really like, uh, I cannot emphasize how important these editions are to both make them accessible, but also put them on the map. Meaning, Abu Hayyan al Ghurnati is definitely like one of the masterpieces of the tradition, but he's not on the map in the narrative of the history, grand history of Tafsir. Now, um, now, this attention to Tafsir works is new and makes researching these massive works feasible in ways that was not possible before. <clears throat> Why? Because also these, these new editions have indices, which anyone who worked on Arabic massive works, they, we don't. Now, they're not the indices that we really want, but they are there. I mean, so for example, in the case of At-Tabari, there's two, two indices, etc. So you, you, at least well, we, have, we have access to the material. Now, the other center of production, so this is Egypt, and this is Egypt with Saudi money. Um, the other center is the Gulf, and mainly Saudi Arabia now. So um, there's um, all the universities in Saudi Arabia have departments of Islamic studies, and these, uh, uh, the, the PhDs there are still the old-fashioned way in which a student is given a chunk of a, ma a manuscript to edit. So for example, there is a massive work of 20 volumes. Each student take a volume uh, and they do dissertation. So by the end of you know, a cycle of PhDs, we have the work edited. Now the problem is these are inaccessible. So all the PhDs in Saudi Arabia, and trust me, I've tried for the last 15 years to get a visit, to get material. It's just, uh, you know, there's so much bureaucracy, you, you can't really do that. Now, what's happening is that people um, are collecting these editions, systematizing them, and publishing them. Two major editions in Tafsir have come out from Saudi Arabia that are really radically important, especially they're smack in my field. The first one was a 24 volume edition of Al Wahidi's Al Basit. Now, this is uh, Al Basit, by the way, in Arabic means the expansive, mm -hmm. and literally it is what it is. It's like a, the like a, the most encyclopedic work of the early medieval times that came out in Nishapur. Now, this work, I've argued, that was a missing link connecting Nishapur to Arazi. So, in, in a sense, we know Arazi, but then uh, how do we know that Arazi, how did he manage to do produce all of that? Uh, because if you look at Arazi, it's 32 volumes. So what was he using? Uh, Al-Basit is at the heart of his work. And in a sense, without an addition of Al-Basit, we really have, we cannot make these arguments. Uh, so we have that. And then I, um, I've worked, my first monograph was on Al-Thalabi. And uh, uh, Professor McAuliffe mentioned Ripon as a trio that united the three of you. As I was finishing, my, uh, Professor Rippon was on my committee, and uh, I, was, I was finishing my, my, um, my dissertation to a monograph, he sends me an email. The work has been published. Well, I worked on manuscripts, so really. So I scrambled to get an, uh, a copy of the edition. It's in Beirut, mm -hmm. 10 volumes. Oh. And it's fascinating. It's, um, it's, uh, it's done, it's a Sunni work done by a Shia Imam using the worst copies for, uh, from Iran because they don't have them, etc. So it was really a letdown. Um, even for the standards of uh, Arabic editions, this was uh, like a, a horrendous one. So, but there it is. And in a way, it took the wind out of anybody who would have thought to do an edition. Luckily, the Saudis didn't, and they produced a 33-volume edition of this Thalabi. Now, this is unbelievably good. I mean, like, mm. you know, I know because I know all the manuscripts. They have, they have used the manuscripts that you want them to use. Um, they have done, they, there's no, like, basically, this is really what you want. And the three volumes at the end are indices. 
Now, so just two works, 24 and 33, how much is that? 75 volumes, and these are two works only. So you can imagine by the end of this lecture, there's at least 170 volumes just from the five, six editions that are produced now. So you could see what massive transformation this is um, impacting the field. Now, with these two works, there's no doubt now that Nishapur was a center of tafsir studies in the Islamic world for two centuries, really. By the way, a point that's um, already made by another professor, uh, Professor Marco uh, Giglio had already made that, but now we have the books at hand. Now, I, I did mention the transformation in the Maison Page, the lay of the page, and I really think that's fundamental to emphasize. Um, tafsir studies is hampered by the fact that most of our uh, works are in this old bulaq thing. So the transformation to a modern page with footnotes, with ease on the eye, is really important to, to access it. Um, now, a new AE, uh, a new AE is a newcomer to the game of Islamic works. Um, and Sharjah University is, 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 doing, is publishing that. So they, they in, uh, issued a 13-volume edition of Al-Makki. Um, I forgot the title, so forgive me. Um, and this is from the Andalusian tradition. And that's really important because the Maliki tafsir tradition does not have, um, does not have representative in the center of the Islamic world. But for those who don't know, UAE is a Maliki uh, a state. So they are heavily invested in producing Maliki works. So, uh, so the addition from Andalusian work to tafsir is really fundamental. Um, I'll mention in passing, Qatar is also uh, doing that. So they, they've issued, uh, reissued a, a massive new edition of uh, Ibn Atiyah, which is really the, the standard edition that just came out. We have an edition before, but this is much more corrected and uh, far better. Now, <clears throat> there's an international prize for Quran in Dubai, which really has been putting out uh, uh, wonderful editions of Islamic works. So for example, they have put the Muwatta of Malik uh, in a new edition, uh, uh, which is really now, I think, the standard among scholars working in, uh, in law. But recently, <coughs> the, the prize went to a tafsir work. Now, to me, this is really heralds a, a major transformation in, on the field. Now, this tafsir work is a gloss, a hashia. Now, the Islamic world have stopped publishing hashias for over 130 years. Only in the 19th century did Muslims publish hawashi of tafsir. By the early 20th century, the notion of decadence have really seeped into the, the elites of the Muslim uh, Cairo. So there, there was a really uh, a distaste uh, for publishing Hawashi, and they stopped publishing Hawashi. Uh, so any, by the way, Hawashi is really, a, so you have the Quran, you have a commentary on the Quran, and then you have a commentary on the commentary. So this is what we call Hawashi, or glosses. Now you could see why, because of certain enlightenment notion, or romantic ideas of the authorial voice, a commentary on a commentary is seen as utter intellectual decadence. So Muslims stopped publishing these. The problem is, from the 12th century, so 13th century onward, this, most of the intellectual output of the Islamic world was in Hawashi form. So to write an intellectual history without paying attention to this is really basically just, you know, a major, major problem. Now, in tafsir, uh, all the hawashis we have, by the way, are on Baydawi uh, of Anwar Tanzil, which is, of course, because all the madrasas up to 1924 taught Baydawi. And Istanbul and Cairo were publishing hawashi uh, on Baydawi. By the way, the first Quran commentary published in the Islamic world was a hashia on al-Baydawi. So in a sense, if you, if you are in the 19th century, the, the, the gloss was the center of tafsir. Now all this disappeared. Now there is a, a forgotten history that there were hawashis on Zamakhshari. So you have two major authors, Baydawi and Zamakhshari. 
uh, at a certain moment in the 15th, 16th century, all the Sunni world moves from the Mahshari to Baydawi, and this is affected in all the uh, madrasas, so for, in Cairo, in Istanbul, uh, in Mughal India, uh, in, uh, in Central Asia, there's the, suddenly there's a shift to Baydawi. Uh, and then in the 19th century, when Muslims start uh, needing textbooks, that's what they publish. But there's five centuries before the 15th century, so from the 13th to the 16th century, that was the Mahshari period. And that's when Muslims were teaching the Mahshari in the madrasas. So all the glosses on tafsir were on the Mahshari, but then they disappear from the whole horizon. So this prize, the 2016 prize in Dubai, was for a new edition of Al-Tibi's gloss on the Mahshari. Now, Al-Tibi is the most important gloss in the scholastic tradition on al Mahshari. It's in beautiful 17 volume uh, edition. Really, um, basically the, the first volume is an introduction that really um, opens the, the book for you and tells you what's going on. But far more important for me is that, um, you know, there comes a moment in an academic career where you realize the horizon of your, um, um, what was that? You, you, they keep promoting you till, what's that? Um, uh, till you reach the, the level of your incapacity or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So you keep writing till you reach the limit of what you cannot do. And I know very well that the gloss and the Zamakhshari story is something I, I keenly know about, but I'm, I neither have now the will or the energy or the time to really do it but you can have graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the publication of this TV has really made it possible for one of my students to want to do on this period, uh, which is really, that's what I mean by, by affecting the, 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 the lay of the land. Now, uh, how much time? Five minutes, good. Now, uh, there is a, there's a group of scholars in Riyadh that they have an institution that studies the tafsir tradition. Now, this is a, uh, this is a group of scholars that is a, a, a fully committed to uh, what we call um, tradition-based understanding of the Quran, or tafsir bil ma'thur. It's really, it's a culmination of almost two centuries of development in modern Islamic tradition in which really an attempt to re refocus who gets to, to talk about the Quran uh, from the Baydawi scholastic tradition to Ibn Kathir Suyuti tradition. And this house is really very committed scholars. I have the honor of meeting them uh, this, uh, this past uh, year. And they have just put out an encyclopedia of Tafsir bil Ma'thur in 24 massive volumes. Each volume is almost a thousand page, so we're talking about 24,000 page. But this, this work took 10 years to, to produce. There was a team of at least 30 scholars working on it. And really, it's really now, for the first time, we have full access to the, uh, to the whole Islamic, not only Sunni, but because they have also used the Shia material, uh, material on the Quran that is uh, narrated by the Muslims. And I mean, I cannot emphasize what a radical uh, impact this, this encyclopedia is gonna have on our field. So now this just came out this year. Uh, so let me, let me tally to you. If, you. if you could sum up the number of vo uh, uh, volumes I've just recounted, <laughs> there's at least 160 to 170 volumes. New volumes uh, just have come out in the last five years in Tafsir. I wanna finish with, I did mention Turkey as a place that, um, now the Islamic awakening in Turkey uh, had meant a Maturidi awakening. Uh, so in a sense, they really rediscovered that they're Maturidis and they're publishing Maturidi works. Now, one of the classics in, Mat in Maturidi tradition is the Tafsir commentary of uh, Al Maturidi himself. Now, as it happens, uh, there was a faltered attempt in the 70s in Cairo, 
which uh, really tells you, like in a sense, the, the faltering um, modernity in Cairo. So there were two volumes come out in Cairo, but they couldn't uh, do it. Then we have simultaneously a Moroccan uh, scholar, female Moroccan scholar, and uh, an Arab scholar. They both published editions in Beirut. Um, they're good. But really, the, uh, the, the, the critical edition of Maturidi came out from Turkey in 17 volumes. Now, this is um, each volume is in this uh, indexed, but there is a cumulative index. I just want to say one thing about like what does a new edition do? I already written an article on the impact it's going to have on us on our understanding. So Maturidi is as early as Tabari, right? So in a sense, this is for a, for a hundred years now we have been working on tafsir based on Tabari. Yet we have Maturidi that we haven't used. Uh, so how, what does that mean for our work? That's one question. The other question is the indices. Uh, sometime in the fourth century, Zajaj moves as if from 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 out of nowhere and becomes in a, embedded in the Sunni tradition. The question to me was, when did this start? Like, how did Zajaj, who is a minor figure, um, move into the Sunni tradition with such force? I stipulated back then with the material I have that it was a Fa'labi, the guy I worked on. But actually, if you look at Maturidi and you look at the indices, in the very middle of the work, he starts using a Zajaj. So the first seven, eight volumes, there's not one mention of the Zajaj. And all of a sudden, with the ninth volume, so you could see that the work has just come to his attention, and now he's incorporating it. And it's fascinating to allow this detailed knowledge of the tradition in tafsir is unprecedented. And it's, uh, it's thanks to these works that are coming out from the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sala. Uh, another wonderful paper. So I want to invite um, the... Um, Panelists, uh, if you have any questions or comments for one another, uh, just to allow you to have that opportunity at the beginning. We have um, four very uh, rich papers um, uh, growing out of this um, rich and beautiful scripture. Yeah, Jane, for your pen. Could I start grilling Walid? I mean, this is absolutely fascinating to see the fluorescence. Uh, Jane, the microphone. Of, of, of new uh, tafasir. Um, Two quick questions. Muqatalib and Suleiman. Um, has anything happened with that, which there was a kind of an abortive attempt years ago in Cairo, it was withdrawn, et cetera. At least that's where my current knowledge stops. Second question is about the indices. You know, what sort of things are they indexing? What can you now use them for? A third question, how soon will they start digitizing these things? Yes. So, um, I think the Muqatil now has become a non-issue, so you can get the fancy five-volume edition from Cairo. Okay. Yeah, that but not a critical edition. It is a critical edition. It, it, is, it? it okay. is. It is. It is the critical. The five. The Shahata edition is uh, is now released, so you can okay. get it. It's not a problem. Now, what the second question was uh, about the indices. Indices. Only, for example, the Turkish edition is what I would call a proper academic modern, uh, like what we would, uh, like in mm -hmm. a sense, edition. The other ones are, they come with their own peculiarities, but they are usable. So they have indices of all the hadith, excuse me, indices of all the poetry, oh. of all the names that they have um, comes the first time. So like uh, the one, so they're peculiar. They're not strictly indices in the way we know them. So the, but they're a massive, massive help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're not exhaustive indices, but they're massive. Uh, the third thing is that because there's no copyright laws in the Arab world, uh, these are uploaded into the internet immediately. Mm. Okay. So uh, actually, you don't, I mean, I'm old fashioned. I, I insist on buying the books, but you don't need that. You, they're all pirated. And they're all, actually, there was this uh, funny story. The, the final, uh, the encyclopedia of uh, from of uh, tradition-based uh, work from Saudi Arabia just came out last year, and then somebody put it in the internet immediately. So they were very upset because that's not even pirating. There seems to be rules. 
So you have to wait till, till they sell enough of it, then you can put it. So they pulled it out of the internet. Hmm. Yeah, and then um, it made the rounds at, in the Arab uh, book fairs, and now I think it's back on the internet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Shadi? Uh, just a, a comment that um, also in uh, Saudi and Riyadh, in the past 20 years, most of the manuals of Qiraat, they are also being published as dissertations. Yeah. And actually, I'm also relying on them. So it's yes. really also changing the way that we look at the variant readings and the transmissions, thanks Absolutely. to all these dissertations being also published in, in Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah, no. and, and, yeah. I mean, I mean if, if I have a plea, is that the center of uh, uh, Al-Walid bin Talal established contacts with, with the National Library in Riyadh so that it allows scholars to access this. Like, if, if we can have that, that would be a great help for scholars of Islamic studies. Because uh, the amount of material uh, done in Saudi Arabia is massive, and really, it really could change how we do our work if we have access to, to the National Library. Okay. Uh, Mohsen, any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. So I actually um, um, have questions uh, for Professor McAuliffe. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted uh, about the turn in your scholarship because um, it, like we, we have like almost like a wave of new studies on uh, not only Islam in America but the place of the Quran in America. And recently, um, the American Quran, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the, yeah, the, the illustrated one. So, uh, so in, in a sense, w what do you think is happening? Like, What's going on in the, in North America? Because the, uh, it's almost like a, a whole wave of new attention. Uh, what, to what do you attribute that for? Well, uh, you know, I I think a good bit of it is the fact that now the American Muslim community is generations old in this country, and so an effort to retrieve the history of Islam in this country, and then more specifically of the Quran, as a natural consequence of that, there are lots of things that are starting to percolate, particularly the history of Islam in America and of contemporary Muslim communities. In terms of the Quran, the studies, there have been some studies done on the very early period of the um, pre-colonial and the, uh, you know, they're, they're scattered in terms of what we can know from the fact that there is not a, a big literature about um, Muslim slaves and their relationship to the Quran and what evidence we have of their incorporation of that into their, their continuing incorporation of that into their lives. But there's more stuff now, and I mean, I was only touching on a few things about the 19th century interest in Orientalism in, in general and literary figures that are familiar to all of us became intrigued with the East, the exotic East, and the, the literatures of the East, and began to turn to that for literary inspiration. And then you have, of course, the entire modern period in which um, the Quran is, is becoming um, a part of the indigenous culture, and, and some of the, the ways in which the Bible is studied or publicized um, or disseminated in this country are also being used for the Quran. So in the, the book that I'm kind of sketching out in very early stages, how far I'll be able to go and, and still have a manageable manuscript, I don't yet know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, before I open it up to general questions, I was wondering if our guest of honor has any comments or questions? Well, actually, I might speak. and Quranic uh, and Islamic scholars, they now have a 10 million euro project over the next six years that will look at the European Quran uh, precisely in the kind of way, James, you're talking about looking at the American Quran, uh, and 
that will range from 1050 to 1850. And they're looking at it all across Europe. I mean, I think they're probably weakest in far eastern Europe. Uh, Hungary, they have some Hungarian scholars involved. But they're looking all the way down to Sicily and Italy and into, uh, of course, Andalusia. Uh, all of the history of how the Koran has functioned, been translated, been reproduced, and so forth in Europe. So I think this is another good sign uh, that we're beginning to get new interest in these kinds of, of ongoing history of the Quran, even in, uh, you know, in Muslim minorities, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. instead of the majority of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bill, that's terrific. That's one of the reasons I came today, just get things like that. <laughs> <laughs> get a shot in the arm. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, would anyone like to uh, offer any comments? Could you please state your name if you, um, if you do so? Yes. Yes. My name is Jocelyn Cesari. My question is to Walid. Uh, the opening of the field is quite amazing. I mean, it's kind of unprecedented. I understand the benefit for scholarship. Are you aware of any way that this new, uh, this new knowledge is channeled into Islamic universities that train people who have to make decisions for the lay Muslim? Mm -hmm. Because this is the key for the tradition. It's, it's, I think, the weak link in all this research. How is it channeled in the way that ulema and imam take on the current issue? Actually, it's a very good question, and it's also um, an impossible uh, to answer, is that there seems to be a keen awareness that they need to do something about it. Uh, how is that going to come about is really not clear. But there is an awareness that they're disconnected from academic world. And um, so there are attempts. I cannot speak to them, but I've seen them. I'm not sure how successful they're going to be or not. But uh, at least there's a keen awareness that there's problems that they're not connected to what's going on. But actually, this is the question. Like, in a sense, we're benefiting here. We're benefiting from these developments, but we're not talking about what's happening there. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Actually, I have a question for, to Shadi. So, Shadi, um, there has been a lot of, like, uh, encyclopedias of Qiraat, like at least two, three uh, now, and then uh, there's uh, the least one that uh, the last one is the Tunisian one. Yes. Yeah. So, like, uh, can you can you offer us like your insights and comments on this? Because I, for, so far, nobody has really done any reviews or academic like input on this. But these are like you know being produced. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one was published in Kuwait, seventy nine, yeah, right? Yeah. Mohassan, yeah. right? And uh, I think this is probably the, uh, the first attempt to collect yeah. you know, the different variant readings into one place. I think six volumes or seven volumes. Yeah. The second one was in Dimashq, right, in Syria, 2001, by Al Khatib, or, mm -hmm. you know. And the third one, which just came recently. Now, um, I think- The Tunisian one. The Tunisian one, yeah. the Tunisian one. Um, Sharafi, Abdul Majid yeah. Sharafi, sure. he was the editor of it. Now, um, I think the, uh, the last one, I, I, I have it. I have all of them, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it is a good addition to the last two ones. But unfortunately, what's happening in these encyclopedias is uh, it's almost like a copy-paste, mm -hmm. what's happening. So you basically go to the sources, you copy what you, know, you have, and then you just put it under the entry. Mm -hmm. um, there are still the same mistakes, the same typos that we have in the first one and the second one. They are still in the third one. OK. And, and these are like you know like typos when when they, they are in the, they are in the or the books right yeah. so and many of these I have a list of the uh, qiraat typos the variant readings I have yeah. them and it's like my criteria just like go to a newly published you know work okay. and then I check do they have the same typo so I have the same typo I just like close the book and I still okay. and I, I just like don't consult it in a sense so like one of the things for example about uh, one of the transmitters uh, his name is Ayash. Mm -hmm. And then it's in Al Bahr al Muhid by Abu Hayyan. I want to now check the new edition. Yes. And in all the three encyclopedias, in the first two encyclopedias, he is uh, uh, Abbas. Mm -hmm. It's like they missed the dots, right? Mm -hmm. 
So the first encyclopedia, he is uh, Abbas. The second one is still Abbas. And in Abdul Majid Sharafi, he is still Abbas. Mm -hmm. But he is actually Ayyash. Mm -hmm. with a, with a, yeah. So, um, yeah, so unfortunately, they're still the same typos. They are consulting the same editions mm -hmm. that we have in the first and the second one. Um, and uh, the addition that we have in the Tunisian one is that they added uh, Jeffrey's uh, Kitab al-Masahif, yeah. uh, his edition, they worked on it. And they have also a new classification of the Mecchi and, you know, the... Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I, st I still think, and that's something that uh, I have actually like been advocating or working for is that to have a digital encyclopedia rather than yeah. really a paper encyclopedia. Searchable, yeah. Uh, searchable, mm. um, searchable and uh, can be updated. Right, yeah. uh, I think just like having the uh, traditional model of an encyclopedia because new manuals of variant readings coming are coming, are coming yeah. out. Thank you. And unfortunately, they are still relying on the same editions that uh, are full of mistakes and right. typos. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Thank you. Uh, you had a question, sir? Could you just say your name, please? Hi, my name is Khalil. Uh, I know <laughs> at least three of you. So <laughs> nice, nice to see you guys here. Um, my question is to the whole panel. Uh, and the question is about um, the prominence and use of tafsir in Quranic studies. Um, some of you, and, and man, there are many studies, especially on Quranic terms or Quranic themes, where tafsir seems to, tafsir literature and related literature like Ulum al Quran seems to be like a major reference point for scholars to elucidate what the Quran may mean or how a verse should be interpreted and whatnot. Um, and my question to you is do you think uh, that there is perhaps an overemphasis on drawing from the tafsir genre? Uh, in terms of how Muslims have interpreted the Quran and in terms of what the Quran you know, could have meant. Whereas we have many non-tafsir genres like Kalam, Falsafa, Ismaili literature where there is Quranic interpretation embedded but it's not in a tafsir format. So my question is do you think like when we're relying a lot on tafsir to do Quranic studies, we're sort of privileging this genre and its approach and we're, we perhaps are missing out on non-tafsir uh, interpretations and is there a way to sort of incorporate that non-tafsir genre into the? You, you know, Professor McAuliffe. <laughs> Professor McAuliffe has already written an article on that. <laughs> I'm, wondering if, I'm wondering if Mosan, you'd like to um, think, just Maybe, answer that first. I mean, yeah, no, well, I know we have other experts, all, but do you have any thoughts? You know, I agree with you completely. I, there is there's lots of commentary in places that are not official commentaries, and there, and people do refer to it, but in in a kind of an episodic way. There isn't usually a systematic fashion of doing this. I, I did note that when we were first starting the Encyclopedia of the Quran, one of the big questions we addressed was, should it be an encyclopedia of the Quran and of tafsir? And as you doubtless know, we didn't include articles about the major mufassadin. Um, in the online edition, we're starting to do that. It was for reasons of scope and size that we restricted it earlier on. But for most of the articles, they, the authors kind of defaulted to the standard tafsir because that's, that was the expected scholarly um, methodology for trying to develop a topic within it. But I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Mohsen, I actually do have a question for you, not about tafsir, I know that's disappointing, but um, yeah, it's about Ismail and your work on um, the Quranic traditions, the Muslim traditions, Islamic traditions within their own terms, just pedagogically and in terms of your own research, how do you encourage mixed or even non-Muslim readers and, and your own students to approach the sacrifice of Ismail on its own terms instead of, as you said, as a derivative of the Akidah? What, what moves do you make and how do you open up that space? Um, what, what would you say? Um, I'd like to maybe first Oh, you Thinking want to tap Sir? Yes, of course. And then, uh, that seems to be the, the theme issue of the morning. Sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, and it's that I, I am guilty of doing that exactly as well, uh, relying on the commentaries. Um, I think there are some, um, some good excuses. Uh, for example, it's just unmanageable if you want to cover everything. And it seems that at least um, methodologically speaking, because the premise of the commentaries is sort of similar to the premise of Quranic studies as we have, which is that we look at the text, we try to look at the relationship between various verses of the text, so on. So that's really the, in the driver's seat. So it seems that we're 
engaging in a conversation with people who are doing sort of what we are doing in a way and coming at the text, looking at the text from, from a similar perspective. Um, so that's one reason I think, at least uh, personally, uh, has driven me to uh, focus on the tapas here. Um, another one is that, you know, we have of course commentaries in many different genres. We have, for example, Sufi commentaries and so on. But again, even those are not, generally speaking, uh, consulted in works of Quranic studies as uh, frequently. Again, because their premise seems to be different, their approach seems to be different. So I think part of the reason why the, they're used is that they just seem to be our pre-modern uh, brethren or sisters in a way and engaged in a similar exercise. But I definitely understand and um, agree that it unfortunately also cuts off things <coughs> and it makes us not see many of the developments that are happening in other parts. Another final thought is that oftentimes uh, people who are doing theology also sort of produce commentaries or people who are doing law have produced commentaries. So it seems that uh, we should sort of expect some at least synergy between what they did in their theological work and their historical work and their uh, commentaries. This is actually sometimes not the case. Uh, for example, if you consult Ibn Kathir's um, Al Bidaya and Nihaya and compare it to his Tafsir al Tabari's Tarikh uh, Rusul wal Muluk and his Tafsir, there are really significant differences sometimes um, in what they mention, even about the same verse, how, how they connect it to. Uh, so there are these differences, but there is hopefully also some something seeping uh, back and forth between these, genre, these genres. Um, now, with regard to, uh, can I, could you uh, maybe elaborate on the question? I was. Uh, you had mentioned Professor Graham's um, uh, methodological intervention <laughs> um, <laughs> of <laughs> taking the Quran on its own terms, and I know that you work on Ismail, and I was just wondering, how do you teach and how do you uh, research and write about Ismail in a way that um, approaches it not as a, a, just a historical or a theological derivative of the Akidah, but on its own terms? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, it is, um, it is a very rife sort of um, subject in a way because mm -hmm. even right now in yeah. Quranic studies there's really, um, there are people who are working on the Quran really very thoroughly, um, systematically from a source critical perspective. Right. In fact, it's been exploding in the past two decades, I think, right. in some ways. Uh, I have participated in that kind of work as well. Mm -hmm. And there are others who uh, would prefer a sort of different tack and either sort of focusing on the later exegetical tradition or just the Quran on its own terms as a sort of uh, textual corpus that, that's examined. I mean, my own sense is that the two are sort of have to be combined in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's unfortunate that many source critical studies just completely um, ignore the post-Quranic writings, and it emanates from a very, um, what we sometimes call the revisionist mm -hmm. understanding that considers those exe exegetes um, and any sort of all the early Islamic um, literary sources as being sort of devoid of any insight about right. uh, the Quran in a way, um, and the context of its revelation, the social and intellectual context of its revelation. So I think I would, uh, I would tend to sort of combine both, mm -hmm. uh, both take the later tradition seriously, but also uh, try to understand w what the Quranic starting point is mm -hmm. in the broader context of the seventh century, sixth century, as it's sort of taking out a new position. And one, one of it uh, for the story of Ishmael, for example, is that if we look at Ishmael's portrayals in Jewish and Christian literature, it's right. overwhelmingly negative. Very negative. And yeah. the Quranic uh, portrayals are, at least it seems in the Meccan period, sort of hesitantly positive and later on much more Extremely sort of, so, yeah. uh, assertive embrace of Ishmael. Um, yeah. So that really isn't, we can't understand what the Quran exactly is doing without understanding mm -hmm. the, the pre-Islamic context. Mm -hmm. But at the same time to just cut everything off and chop everything after the Quran just seems to be doing violence to religious history in a mm -hmm. way. And I think Professor Graham's work has been, you know, hopefully to some extent remedying that, uh, that defect in the previous scholarship. Thank you, Mohsen. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes. 
Could you say your name, please? Sure. My name is Marian. Um, and my question is for Professor Nasser. I was wondering. Could you speak up a little? Sure. Sorry. Um, I was wondering what um, was said in traditional scholarship about the reliability of some of these narrators, considering that those descriptions were passed on. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering what was said. The reliability of the? Uh, the transmitters. Oh, the transmitters. Okay, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I'm not sure everyone heard it. Yeah. Okay, okay, sure. Or, yeah. Can, why don't you say it again, just slower and louder for all the okay. dinosaurs listening. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering what was said in traditional Islamic scholarship about the reliability of some of these uh, transmitters mm -hmm. of the recitations of the Quran, given that those descriptions were transmitted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the, uh, the challenges that they had to, to face. And then what they did is that they separated the... Uh, probity or adala of the Quran transmitters as being Quran transmitters and then they were bad in hadith but good in Quran. So you could have good memory as a Quran reciter but you could have bad memory as a hadith transmitter. So this is how they solved it. So and then you would have you know these later biographical dictionaries say he's trustworthy in Quran but he's weak in hadith. So and then they basically reached the conclusion that there is a separation in the disciplines and you don't have to be Adil, you don't have to be trustworthy in all disciplines. So you could be, you know, the Quranist are Quranist, the Muhaddithun are Muhaddithun, the Jurist are Jurist, and there's no overlap. And that's a problem because, you know, there's, as we know, academic adala and moral adala. And the moral one should not really be um, a bubble, you know, in this discipline or that discipline. Uh, so that's the solution they offered. Um, many scholars disagreed with that. Uh, Muslim scholars, and he said, well, wait a second, you're saying he's kathab, he's a liar, so it doesn't matter if you lie in hadith or if you lie in Quran. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, over here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sukidi. I'm a student of Bill Graham. Uh, I'd like to take up, I'd like to follow up your your question of method, actually, uh, with regard to Graham works. Because to me, this is one of the Im important uh, subject matters. Mm. Uh, Mohsin raised the question that Graham is working on the Quran on its own term, which is, uh, in some part, I agree with him, with reference to his earliest meaning of the Quran which is an, an, a classic article written by, by Graham in, in the word of Islam. Mm -hmm. But the, the early scholarly work by Graham is actually prophet, uh, divi divine word and prophetic word, which is to place the emphasis on the is early Islamic, the significance of the early Islamic community understanding of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So here, here, here is my concern actually. The method of studying the Quran is it is it is it properly study is it proper to study the Quran on its own term? Precisely because it's really hard to understand the Quran itself <laughs> on its own term. Mm -hmm. uh, just mention, let's say, wa najmi ida hawa, the surah najm. What is najm here? What is hawa here? If we just read the translation. Most translator will say, by the star when it fall. But if we read Ja'far Sotik, the Shi'i interpreter, he will say that it is the meaning by Muhammad when he fall. But if we read Tobari, it's going to be has different meaning. It is by the Quran when it fall. Mm -hmm. so, so here, whether we really study, actually, uh, to me, uh, Bill Graham is trying to read the Quran in some part on its own term, but also in other parts in relation to the development and the, the promotion of the early Islamic community. So using the vocabulary of Walid Salah, it is Quranic studies, but also it is uh, interpretative studies or tafsir studies. And Graham tried to to, to read the Quran in some part on its own term, but also in some part in the light of the early Islamic community. So that is why in, the, in his early scholarly work, he, 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 didn't, he didn't exactly try to read, try to, to act as Mufasir. 
but rather try to appreciate the importance of the early Islamic community and the understanding of the Quran mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. of the revelation mm -hmm. of how the Quran, as he put it, is ongoing recitation mm -hmm. in the early Islamic. It's not the Quran as a text itself, but rather as something that is still happening. It's still going on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. And to understand the Quran is something still happening and still reciting mm -hmm. is not the product of reading the Quran on its own term, but rather reading of the early Muslim community, understanding of the Quran itself. Yeah, thank you. So um, that is the method actually that I try to raise. Here. Yes, thank you. Um, Bill, do you want to respond to that? Okay. Um, would you like to summarize a bit louder and slower two or three sentences for Professor Graham, just so he could hear? Um, we couldn't, he couldn't quite hear everything you said. Well, yeah, no, that's okay. He'll ask you about what you didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. I can do that. The uh, gist of the question is, is that your work is not necessarily, to, early work is not necessarily to act as a mufessa in the Quran, right. but to think of the Quran um, and the evolution of the way that yeah. we read the Quran against the community at the time yeah. and how the community understood the yeah. Quran. So yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, that's, I, I heard part, parts of that. I don't know whether it would really be fair to say that I, my early work was even really focused very much on the Quran alone. I worked a lot with the Hadith. What I was interested in, I think, was the degree to which uh, in the early period, it strikes me still, even now, after many more years of reading, reading Islamic texts uh, and reading the work of people such as the four here in front, from which I've learned just tremendous amounts, um, uh, it strikes me that in the early period, uh, what I seem to discern in the Hadith literature and in the, I would say in the Akbar as well, because I think in things like the Musnad of Ibn Hanbal, one really has almost more Akbar than a Hadith uh, in a lot of ways. We've got a lot of very primitive traditions there that I think what interested me early on was the degree to which uh, the early Muslim community, I think, had a much looser attitude uh, mm -hmm. towards things that later became theologically impossible mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to deal with except in a very rigid way. You had to have Quran isolated from Hadith. You had to have Revelation isolated from Inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, you had lots, I think, of lines drawn later on. And so all I was trying to do, I think it's certainly my first book, all I was really trying to do was to look at all the traditions that, uh, that seemed to say, uh, that I would ask, why would people have kept this tradition uh, about the prophet having uh, given revelations in two different ways, or mm. the prophet he hearing a reciter, uh, you know, say uh, say something, you know, add something to uh, to what is just that he has just recited from the Quran, and the prophet says, yes, that's what comes next. I mean, there was a much looser notion uh, about revelation and about even the prophet's role, and I think that's. I think that's primarily the thing that interested me early on was the degree to which in the early community you have a lot, a lot I would say, looser uh, relationship to what later uh, would be texts that are or, or in orthodox thinking, if you want to call it that, um, had become rigidly understood as either externally revealed Quran or just inspired words of the prophet or even in, in words of the, of the Sahaba. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the companions of the prophet. Uh, that's what interested me early on. So I think that may be what, what you were talking to. But I wasn't early on really focused on Quran in particular. I mean, as I say, it was work I think of people like Jane in particular that began to move me more from a hadith to uh, Qaraeen, if you like. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd have to say that, that that was not a focus for me early on. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, yes, here? Uh, thank you for uh, all the wonderful talks. I definitely learned a lot from all the scholars on the panel. Um, I have a question uh, specifically for Dr. Nasser, but for the rest of the panelists as well, if um, y'all could add insight. 
Um, the question was um, on the seven uh, transmitters that you mentioned that were facilitators of canonizing the Quran. Can you kind of speak more to kind of what the variations between them and then subsequently their students were? So from what I extracted, one was like the mode of transmission, another was like uh, like Qur'at. Um, was there like transmission not only in like recitation but also like substantive content differ differences? And if there were, like can you like give a, can you give us examples on like what those variations uh, uh, how sure. those variations took form. Uh, we are talking about the, the canonical corpus only? Okay, yeah, so, so let's see, the uh, seven readers, um, uh, they, the differences amongst the seven readers themselves, forget now about the transmitters, they, we classify the differences into two categories. One is we call usul and one we call farsh. So the usul is basically a technique that the reciter uses throughout the Quran. So if you have a technique in uh, pronouncing the alif or you do assimilation, that's something that you apply throughout the Quran. The farsh is a specific individual word that uh, is only applicable on, in its uh, position, right? Uh, vowels, dots, etc. So the seven uh, readers, they disagree amongst one another in both, in the usul and in the farsh. So the principles of recitation and in the, the individuals. The students, the, the students of the transmitter, they mostly agree on the farsh, the uh, individual words, but they disagree on the principles of recitation. So you would fo find, for example, uh, hafs, let's say, and shaba. Uh, if you listen to both uh, the recording, you would find that shaba's uh, principles of recitation are different from hafs. And there are still some individual variants also between them. So I would say the differences in the canonical uh, corpus is uh, the way that you pronounce things and the, the way you recite, and also some of the vowels and dotting. Uh, an example, let's say, imala, um, uh, let's say majraha, for example. You know, you would say hafs, who would say majreha, and then shu'ba, who would say majraha, right? Mm -hmm. um, something like that. Uh, but both of them, they say, well, Asim taught us as such. Uh, now, when it comes to the irregular of the regular, uh, you, we would go beyond that. So there are even readings which disagree with the rasm, what we call the consonantal text, and they are still, some of them are attributed to the seven readers. But in Islamic, um, basically, uh, history, they called that shawad al saba the irregular readings of the canonical readings. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so differences would be uh, limited to, to that corpus. Yeah. So I'm afraid that'll have to be our last question. Thank you so much for your comments and questions. And a, a really warm uh, thanks to our panelists for a really exciting and interesting uh, panel and to Professor Graham for being such a gracious uh, respondent. Mm -hmm.